Whereas in flag football, it's, it's kind of a free-for-all. Everybody has that opportunity. And I just think it's a great way to teach the game in a very safe way that certainly parents feel comfortable about. And it, it still engages the kids, and it still gets them excited about it to where at some point they transition to pads. Dayon Buchanan of the Arizona Cardinals told me in training camp this year that his first two years playing, he played flag football. And the reason why he feels that all kids – the introduction to football should be flag football is because he said, you got to realize when you're in fifth, sixth, seventh grade, the idea of learning football and then learning the physical part of it, knowing that you might get knocked down and mm-hmm. everything to a kid, that's a really big deal. Mm-hmm. And he said, you got to get kids to love football, love the sport itself. Right. And some kids, they might get hit really hard their first year playing football and say that's not for me i'm going to play soccer or whatever or whatever it is right i I just i think that's a really enlightened idea i think you will bring a lot more people to the sport by starting them off with flag football to that point because you you get them to fall in love with the sport and then you gradually evolve to the physical nature of the game speaking of the physical nature of the game so you are about six feet tall not a huge statuesque quarterback. It's amazing when you think about it that you've lasted as long as you have. You've always been a player's guy. You've been very involved in players' issues. So how much are you concerned about your physical well-being at 50, 55, 60, when you have four children who are going to be four young adults at that time? Well, I, I imagine my body and my joints are going to hurt a little bit more than they otherwise would have if I had not played football. But, um, you know, I, I feel like I try to be as aware and uh, stay on top of my, my body and my health as much as I possibly can. Now, listen, this is a physical sport. It's a violent sport at times. I play the quarterback position where, yeah, I'm getting hit, but I'm not – I'm not thumping like the guys, you know, on the, on the front line, you know, the O line, D line, linebacker, you know, defensive players, and and others. But still, there is there is a physical toll that it does take on you. I try to do all the right things to take care of my body throughout the season and throughout the off season because I want to be able to play this game for as long as I can, and I want to be in great physical health when I leave this game. You know, most importantly too. I think that we know so much more now than we did even three years ago, five years ago in regards to specifically, you know, head and neck injuries. I think that the protocols are in place now to take care of guys when those issues do happen because, listen, they will happen. You know, it's football, and those collisions are are hard. And while we're trying to, I think, evolve in regards to the technique of tackling and different things, it's still going to happen. But whereas in the olden days, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you get dinged and it's, hey, it's a toughness thing to stay in and, you know, not, you know, be away from your team and suck it up and, you know, just go. We now know how much damage that can cause, just that re- the repeated effects of, you know, banging your head after you've have had an instance. So I think now, like, for example, you know, Luke Keekley last year, arguably one of the best defense players in this league, has a concussion in week one to hold him out for three weeks. Would that have happened 20 years ago? No, no, no. He probably would have gone in as quickly as he could, right? But now we know that. Listen, this is this is this guy's long term health, and there's lots of instances like that where let's make sure he's healthy. Let me ask you what Ben Roethlisberger did last year. The Steelers are in Seattle. They're down thirty eight to thirty. There's about two to three minutes left in the game, and Roethlisberger in the middle of this big pennant race game, mm-hmm. goes to his trainer and says, I don't feel right. You know, I don't feel right. And he left the game. Now, whether they would have won the game or not, but that that to me was, I don't know if you'd call it a defining moment, but I thought it was a pretty incredible moment that a guy without anybody going to him and saying, hey, we're examining you, he self-reported. Now, mm-hmm. so if that's you, could you have done that, and would you have done that? I think it's nearly impossible to rely on the player themselves to self-report. You know, I, I think m- maybe there's times where that will happen, but I, I would say in large part that's why you've got 
the trainers and the referees and the, the independent neurological consultant now that's on the sideline to identify those players because I, I think it's it's hard to expect guys to do that. I mean, but good, what about good, you? Good for him. <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't think I would. I would not self-report. Yeah. Um, but looking back now, if somebody pulled you out of the game, how would you feel about that? You'd probably be angry about it, wouldn't you? Well, that's that happened to me back in 2004 when I was in San Diego. I got a concussion playing against the Jets. I was out for a moment of time on the field and got up, and I had chipped teeth in my mouth and spit it out. It felt like a gravel in my mouth. I got hit in the chin, and I stayed in for another quarter, but, man, I knew things were not right. And my eventually my offensive coordinator, Cam Cameron, looked in my eyes and said, you don't look like you're all there. He said, I know you got, I know you took a shot out there. He said, I'm, I'm sitting you down. And, and I fought him on it for a while. And he said, no, this is for your long-term health. I'm sitting you down. Wow. And so. God, that's 12 years ago that happened. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, again, I, I wasn't going to pull myself out. I wasn't going to pull myself out. It, it was a close game trying to go win. I wasn't going to pull myself out. That really is, I mean, everybody talks about the important issues facing the NFL and, and all that. But to me, Roger Goodell has one job over the next however long he's going to be commissioner and who knows how long that's going to be but he's got one job and that is making as lofty as this sounds it's making the parents of america trust that everything is being done everything to make sure that the long-term health of the players who play in the nfl is paramount in his interest and i wonder do you think the nfl now is doing enough about player health and safety i think that it's a joint effort between the pa the nfl players association and the nfl um i don't think that we as players can just rely on the nfl to do those things i think we it has to be um a joint effort and i think it really has to be driven by the players association just as it was during this last round of negotiations our number one priority going into those negotiations in 2011 was to improve player health and safety and I think that we made huge strides in doing that. And I think that we've made it known that that is and will always be our number one priority. This is the MMQB Podcast. Podcast. This is Adrian Wojnarowski of The Vertical. For candid conversations with the biggest names around the NBA, be sure to check out our podcast network, which includes The Vertical Podcast with Woj, The Vertical Podcast with J.J. Redick, and The Vertical Podcast with Chris Mannix, all at thevertical.com, iTunes, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Football is back, and SeatGeek is the smartest, easiest way to find tickets for the games you want to see up close and in person this season. You know, there's nothing like being in the stadium for the biggest plays of the year, and with SeatGeek, it's never been easier to get the seats you want for great value. SeatGeek has the best deals on every ticket in the house, wherever you want to sit whether it's the 50, the club seats, or the upper deck. Now pay attention to this next part. It's really important. My listeners get a $20 rebate off their first SeatGeek purchase. That's 20 bucks right in your pocket. And to get it, all you have to do is this. Download the free SeatGeek app and go to the Settings tab. Click Add a Promo Code. Then enter promo code MMQB. SeatGeek will then send you the $20 after you've made your first ticket purchase. It doesn't get any easier than that. Download the free SeatGeek app and enter promo code MMQB today. Now, let's get back to our guest. Here we are with Drew Brees in New Orleans. So, I want to ask you a couple of issues in the NFL right now. Do you think the players will ever, under any circumstances, accept an 18-game regular season? No, I don't. I don't. The The argument that's tried to have been presented to us is, well, you know, we'll just eliminate two preseason games and just tack on two regular season games, and it's pretty much the same thing. It still adds up to 20. But no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> those are different games. Yeah, You know, um, the preseason, I think, is necessary in a lot of ways for evaluation of young players. It's where a lot of these young guys get their opportunities to develop, to be a part of the team long term. And so... I think that um, at the end of the day, adding two games is adding a lot of stress on your body, especially when you when you really just think about 
you know, the latter part of the season, if you look at statistics, that's when there's the highest instances of injuries and that kind of thing. Because just, you know, your body hits a fatigue. And so now you're talking about adding two more of those types of games when it's just going to increase the chance of injury exponentially. So I don't think that will ever happen. I think it's it's fine just the way it is. If Agreed. anything, there might be a chance to add maybe another playoff team in each conference. So, you know, I think that that, that will add another game into the, into, the, into the playoff equation, which I don't think anybody would complain about, you know, fans or, or teams. But um, obviously that's to be negotiated. Is Roger Goodell the best man right now to be leading the National Football League? <laughs> <laughs> Tough questions, right? Listen, I, I, think, I think Roger Goodell has done a very good job in regards to revenue generation, ideas to uh, expand the popularity of the game of football. I obviously don't agree with the way that some of these NFL investigations have been handled um, in regards to you know Bounty Gate with us back in 2012, in regards to the Ray Rice situation, in regards to uh, Tom Brady. Can I just interrupt you and ask sure. you this? I, in my opinion, Roger Goodell used a sledgehammer to kill an ant with Tom Brady. I think it's in, I'm still incredulous that a guy that they never proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that he was in on any sort of deflation scheme. And they never even proved categorically that the balls were deflated. And to give a guy a four game suspension for that, I thought was really heavy. But some quarterbacks feel like, hey, you know, that quarterback is going to know about the deflation of the ball. He's going to be able to feel it. It's going to be a really big deal. How did you feel about that, both the penalty and what exactly happened there? Yeah, I don't know if, if, if it happened or if it didn't happen with the Patriots and, and the deflate gate thing. But what I can say is that I certainly don't trust any NFL-led investigation at this point based upon the, la- the three that I just mentioned. There is zero transparency when it comes to any of those investigations. There's been proven to be a lot of faulty things going on with all of those investigations, a lot of criticism. And at the end of the day, I feel like there's an agenda at play with the league office when it comes to some of these issues and that they are going to devise the end result of the investigation to fit their agenda. Um, I feel like with Bounty Gate in our situation back in 2012, that the NFL was under a lot of heat for player health and safety. And so they had to make an example out of somebody. And this in the New Orleans Saints just happened to be the most convenient one. And the punishment that was levied on Sean Payton and Joe Vitt and our, you know, so many people within our, our, uh, our management and then our team, I thought was completely ridiculous based upon the evidence that they supposedly had that at the end of the day, all the players who were, you know, ended up being suspended were all vindicated of, of what they were accused of. By Paul Tagliabue. By Paul yeah. Tagliabue. Yeah. So just the irony in that and the fact that, I mean, I think that just proved right there that um, they had an agenda that they were driving. They were, you know, skewing all the evidence to fit that. And at the end of the day, it blew up in their face. Um, and it continues to happen, which is the reason why we need neutral arbitration. And we need somebody to be able to step in that makes it to where, you know, Commissioner Goodell and the NFL is not judge, jury, executioner when it comes to NFL discipline and certainly running investigations. Then again, though, you had that opportunity in 2011. And but again, I remember D. Smith telling me, he said, well, basically, he said, we, we knew that it, that was an absolute non-starter with the league at that time. But I don't think it's going to be a non-starter in the next negotiations or even maybe before then. Yeah, uh, you're exactly right. And I said it earlier um, that player health and safety was our number one priority back in 2011. You know, And so uh, in any negotiation... And that, you accomplished a lot with that. We did. I mean, with the off-season. In any negotiation, yeah. there's, there's give and take. Yeah. And so that was something that was important to them, player health and safety. And there were some other things that were important to us. So at the end of the day, we as players, we, want, we wanted a fair deal. And we felt like we got a fair deal. Unfortunately, the commissioner discipline aspect of it has proven to be a real problem. Last question here with Drew Brees in New Orleans. So, Drew, you know a lot about pro football history. And as we record this, you're about 10,000 yards away from the all-time passing yardage record. You're 103 touchdown passes away from the all-time touchdown record. 
How meaningful are those numbers to you? In a game that is an ultimate team game, you've always been the kind of guy you want to leave footprints in the sand. So how important is it for you to hold those records? It's more important for me to win another championship, but I'd be like, 